Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mormonish. I'm Rebecca. And I'm Landon. And we have a guest that you probably will recognize returning again for, gosh, I think the fourth time we can't get enough of the amazing Rob Lauer. How are you, Rob? I'm good. I'm tired. I'll try not to fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we might. We might just take a minute in the video, it, when we, the episode where we just kind of just take a little nap. nap. But no, we can't. There's too much to discuss and it's too important. So yeah, Rob was just recently in Utah, where Landon and I are, um, for the premiere of the Reader's Theater of the Beehive State. So we got to meet Rob in person, which was really amazing. And that video will be coming out soon. So stay tuned, everybody, for that. But in the course of, you know, talking with Rob and going out to dinner and interacting with him, we were talking about sort of the news of the day, which last week was the sale of the Kirtland Temple, you know, the artifacts, all of that kind of stuff. So yeah. we were talking about that. And Rob, who you may know him as a playwright, because that's kind of how we talk to him here, but he is a history buff of the restoration. He knows, I would say everything, wouldn't you, Landon? <laughs> He knows a lot. That's for sure. He knows a lot. He <laughs> I'm does. a nerd. So I wore my nerd <laughs> glasses. Okay. <laughs> That's it. And so he started, we started discussing how the information that they might be telling visitors in the Kirtland Temple might be changing now. The COC, Community of Christ, had a certain narrative that they shared from their religious perspective. And now the LDS Church will have a different narrative. And Rob started telling us a little bit about just sort of the ideas behind this, what might be different. And we were fascinated and we said, okay, we need to share this with our viewers and listeners because I hadn't really heard anything or even thought about this before. So we are really excited to bring this information to you. And Rob has put together a wonderful slideshow and presentation called Elijah Keys and the Kirtland Temple, the creation of the Utah LDS narrative. So we're just going to let Rob take it away and we will ask questions, right, Landon, and try to interact as we can. But this information to me is kind of mind blowing, I think. Well, thanks. Well, one thing that has always impressed me is that LDS seem to have no idea of what the community of Christ, our LDS version of, of a temple is. And one thing that I've seen in recent years cropping up in a lot of LDS discussion groups is the idea that the Kirtland Temple was like a preparatory temple for the real temple, mm -hmm. which was like Nauvoo and the temples in Utah. So uh, one thing I wanted to show the first slide, which is basically comparing the Kirtland Temple to the Nauvoo Temple, the original Nauvoo Temple. And they were virtually the same. They were essentially just for public worship. They had two big assembly halls, one downstairs, one upstairs. And uh, this is where until they built the Kirtland Temple, the sites had no churches. There were no chapels or anything like that. In fact, in Joseph Smith's diaries, when they were building the Kirtland Temple, when they were still in Kirtland, he referred to the Kirtland Temple, not as the temple, but as the chapel. And so that was, you know, it was, it was where you went for Sunday worship. And the same thing was going to be happening with the Nauvoo Temple when it was completed. So you can see from this diagram, they are virtually the same. Um, in the Nauvoo Temple, they added a baptistry for the baptism for the dead on the 12 oxen in, in the basement. But the upstairs room where the offices were, the attic, had an open space in the middle. And that is where they would hang veils and basically perform the endowment. And when they were finished with that, they'd take the veils down. And there's one account they actually had a dance up there one night. Hmm. after the, And uh, there were some problems with the floor. It almost caved in. But uh, if you go wow, to the like next, a rave, that sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah, right. I'm they, gonna they, go back to the temple. They had a rave dance. Yeah, they, yeah, and they almost brought the, the temple down. This is a diagram uh, of the Saint George Temple, which was the first temple built in Utah. Interestingly, it was not the third Mormon temple. The third Mormon temple was actually a log temple built in Zodiac, Texas, under Apostle Lyman White. Joseph Smith sent him to Texas with some saints to start a community there with the idea of maybe moving there if things got bad in Nauvoo. So the third temple was actually a log temple in Zodiac, Texas, that has long since been gone. I've, I've never is, heard of that. I have never heard of that before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If it yeah. was there, I'm going to go buy it because I could turn <laughs> that into 192 million bucks. That's it. Let's <laughs> yeah. go, Landon. Get yeah, in the car. I, I think they... I think uh, I fell down. I think the only remains of that community there, I think there's still some, a graveyard there. But Lyman White eventually joined the re reorganization in Missouri. But this is uh, basically a drawing of what the St. George Temple 
looked like. This was the first temple in, in Utah. Go to the next slide. Just, just a second. So Lyman White joined the RLDS and he'd created the temple. Is that the reason they've kind of erased that out of history? Because no, no, I've no. never he, heard he, of no. this. He, Lyman White was basically, he was in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He's one of the original Twelve Apostles. Uh, he was the oldest of the Twelve Apostles. And Joseph Smith, weirdly enough, or interestingly enough, basically uh, seniority in a quorum was based on age, not standing, not how long you've been in it. So Lyman White, although he was not the president of the quorum, was actually like the senior apostle because he was the oldest. Before Joseph Smith died, they were talking about exploring different places where the saints could go, Wisconsin, the Pacific Northwest, California, and Texas, which I think at the time was still an independent republic, maybe. And so Lyman White and some of the saints went down to Zodiac, a place called Zodiac, Texas, and set up a community, a Mormon community there. And it was there for about a half dozen, maybe 10 years. And they built a temple there, a log temple. They actually did the endowment in it, uh, but it, it was a, a temple. That was actually the third Mormon temple. When they left Zodiac and went back to the Midwest and, and beyond, uh, the temple, I guess, fell into disrepair and fell down. It was a log temple. It was made of logs. Huh. So I just, not... I've never heard that. So yeah. that, that's... You have to dig in, Landon. Yeah. Already, we're like five minutes in. This isn't <laughs> even the whole topic, and we're like blown away. <laughs> Do a research, go online. Some of his there's actually a couple of books, or at least one book uh, called Saints like Polygamy on the I can't think of the title now, but uh some historians have written about that, a little bit about that okay. temple. <laughs> but uh anyway, the St. George Temple was the first temple in Utah. And as you can see from this drawing, which is from the period, it was laid out exactly like the Kirtland Temple. Again, if you go to the next slide, it will show uh, that. You have a lower assembly, you have an upper assembly, uh, you have small rooms, and then the endowment and the baptistry were in the basement. Okay, then around in 1937 to 1938, the St. George Temple was closed and they remodeled it. And the lower assembly hall was done away with, and the endowment rooms, it was based off, and that became the endowment rooms, the celestial room, the terrestrial room, which is how it was until, I guess, recent modifications. But they actually remodeled it. So basically, my point is the Kirtland Temple was the model for the Nauvoo Temple and the first temple in Utah, which was the St. George Temple. And so they actually were more alike than not. The original uh, Nauvoo Temple and St. George Temple did not center architecturally around the endowment. They centered yes. around assembling, assemblies, the same so did, together. Did, did they use this on Sunday? The St. George Temple would be used for going to church i'm not sure if, if how if they did or how often they did I, i'm assuming they did when when they finally opened uh but at the same time around the same time right after they started building in most utah towns tabernacles and you belong to your neighborhood ward but on sunday afternoon or evening the entire town went to the tabernacle all the wards went together and had sacrament meeting in the afternoons and the evening in tabernacles Hmm. And uh, there really weren't chapels. They had like relief society buildings and bishop storehouses and offices. And they might have a Sunday school or a cultural hall, an LDS cultural hall. But it wasn't until the, into the 20th century that all those were sort of combined with what we know as like the modern day LDS chapel meeting house. Uh, but until that point, yeah, until they started building tabernacles, basically you met, on Sunday you met in I don't know, social halls, barns, outdoors, certainly in Joseph Smith's day, the only big bed outdoors and in barns and, and places trees. like that. Yeah. Okay. They were meeting in Where'd they play basketball? Yes, there were. I don't know where they played basketball. <laughs> I, I, I do know that, that Joseph Smith and in Nauvoo, they, they took up baseball. Oh, well, really? Exactly. Okay. Ken Burns actually talked about that in his special about baseball, that, wow. that Joseph Smith and the Saints were, were big fans once it became introduced. <laughs> That is okay. fascinating. Oh, my goodness. So um, let me see the next slide then. Let's go to that one. And where was the first time this idea of Elijah appearing in the Kirtland Temple and giving keys? Where do we find that? When was that? And um, anyway, um, it was not made public until a special conference of the church in August of 1852, 
put the wrong date there at the bottom. And it was a public sermon that Orson Pratt delivered called Celestial Marriage on August 29th, 1852 in Salt Lake City. The purpose of this conference was to announce to the world that, yes, the Mormons have been practicing polygamy for some time, and they now embraced it as a commandment for all members of the church. And uh, so I'm going to read some of this. Um, and uh, so this is Orson Pratt speaking. And basically, he's laid out the entire case of a restoration of plural marriage. And then he gets to the point of only one man on earth at a time holds the keys or that gives you the authority to perform plural marriages. Of course, that man here is Brigham Young. That was the whole point of this. So he said, in these last days, let me announce to this congregation, there is but one man, excuse me, can't really see here, hold on just a moment, <laughs> in all the world at the same time who can hold the keys to this matter. Uh, let me see. I, hold on just a moment here. I, you're blocking my screen. Are we blocking it? Oh, we can also read too. My, okay, there it is. Okay, there it is. So in these last days, let me announce to this congregation that there is but, but one man in all the world at the same time who can hold the keys of this matter, but one man has power to turn the key to inquire of the Lord and to say whether I or these our brethren or any of the rest of this congregation or the saints upon the face of the whole earth may have this blessing of Abraham, meaning polygamy, conferred upon them. He holds these keys now the same as Nathan in his day. But, says one, how did you obtain this information? By new revelation. When was it given and to whom? It was given to our prophet and seer and revelator Joseph Smith on the 12th day of July, 1843, only about 11 months before he was martyred for the testimony of Jesus. That, of course, is what we now know as DNC 132. He, Joseph, held the keys of these matters. He had the right to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord has set bounds and restrictions to these things. He has told us in that revelation that only one man can hold these keys upon the earth at the same time, and they belong to that man who stands to, at the head to preside over all of the affairs of the church and the kingdom of God in these last days. They are the sealing keys of power or in other words, of Elijah, having been committed and restored to the earth by Elijah the prophet, who held many keys, among them which were the keys of the sealing, to bind the hearts of fathers to children and the children to the fathers, together with all the other sealing keys and powers pertaining to this last dispensation. They were committed by that angel who administered in the Kirtland Temple and spoke unto Joseph Smith at the time of the endowments in that house. Okay, so that was the first time it was made public to anyone that Elijah had appeared in Kirtland back in 1836 and had committed the keys to Joseph Smith. Until so then, 1836, <laughs> 36 to 52. So we're yeah. talking uh, <laughs> 17 years. Am I doing the math? Four, five, yeah, six, yeah, yeah. 16, yep. 17 years later, right. before so, anyone knows anything about Elijah anything about coming. Is it written anywhere? Or is this the first time it's publicly made known? It's or publicly in the Joseph Smith papers. There are two references to letters, and they they, they say is evidence. But actually, what, I think both of them are by by Mormon women saying that uh, the the prophecies of Mal in Malachi, which is where you get the reference to Elijah coming, are coming true. So but that's what is, not saying that Elijah the prophet appeared and gave keys to Joseph Smith to perform plural marriage or to seal, you know, in families. The Temple. So right, what is the, the date Temple. 1843 then, July 12th? July, okay, let's... Um, I'm just saying, what is... That, so that's in, the... In, that's that, that, that's, that's DNC 132. Okay, that, okay, but in plural 36 marriage. is right. when so that event happened. So all of that happened. was revealed, at, that, that was revealed okay. in this conference too, that okay. revelation was. Until, okay. until August of 1852... That, that revelation of marriage had not been made public. So what you're saying is that in 1836, that is when we were actually just at the Church History Museum yesterday, looking at some of the artifacts that now belong to the LDS Church that are on display in a special special display room um, from Kirtland from the Kirtland Temple. And one of the paintings that is it's kind of on another floor, but it it depicts this of Elijah and Elias and Moses coming. And I did ask the guide, I said, when, you know, when was this written down? When did we learn about this? And he said, you know, I don't know. 
<laughs> that's what he said. And I said, well, that's very interesting. I don't know either. I'd like to find out more. Maybe take this to one of your meetings and find out and let people know. But so this is why the Kirtland Temple is so important, because this is where this supposedly happened. Right. And as I understand it, Community of Christ, when they give their guided tours, this is not part of what they discuss. But now, because this is a pivotal moment, absolutely foundational to, you know, the Brighamite uh, LDS church, they have to share this narrative, I believe now in, in the tours that they're, that they're leading. So, but this is just incredible. So just yeah. to make sure everybody understands, nobody is, it's one of those backdated things, right? Where years later yes. they go, oh, and wait, did you not know? This happened and 17 years. Is that what you said, Landon? I was thinking when you were doing math. Yeah, yeah. I, 16 years or so. And yeah. and yeah, this is this is fascinating because That's it incredible. seems like anytime they need power of some sort, yes. they all of a sudden come up with where that power came and it's, from. It's almost like in, in, in his sermon, Orson and Hyde realize how this must be sounding to people out there who, again, 17 years later, they followed Joseph Smith. They've decided to follow Brigham Young. They're settling in Utah. They've been in Utah at this point for, you know, five years or so. And, you know, they say, but how, how did you obtain this information? You know, how was it given? He, he knows that this is all news to the people, to the congregation at large he's talking to. And, and to, this is all brand power. new to them. I, exactly. I can just see them turning to each other and go, did you know that? I didn't did you know that. what? Did you know? Yeah. And that explains why the reorganized church, you know, they didn't have this information. They stayed. They did not go to Utah where, you know, Orson Pratt can give this information. So right. that's and, really and, interesting. And it's funny, it's funny because the, the community of Christ, or what is really good about the community of Christ, when you took their tour, they, I mean, they they didn't cover up anything. I mean, right. you, you could ask them any questions about anything. Right. And I'm sure people ask, LDS visitors probably ask them about this all the time. But uh, they, they would say, oh, yeah, people, you know, that for, for weeks, you know, all the, the Mormons, they were having everybody was having visions and 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 seeing angels and mm -hmm. seeing prophets and all this stuff so it was happening to everybody to them that was sort of it was like pentecost in the new testament right or the you know and so they, they will acknowledge again yeah, that tons of people were recording and claiming to have visions and right. seeing angels on the roof and things like that <laughs> and i guess so. we should make clear probably to you know we do have viewers and listeners that are never mormons these ceiling keys are foundational to Mormonism. I mean, in this case, they're talking about, you know, polygamy and sealing has, you know, husbands to wives, but th this is foundational to Mormonism. We believe that our families, because of these powers and keys, will be together in the next life. Whereas if you are not sealed in this way, you will not be together as a family unit as we understand it. So this is the foundational Mormon doctrine right here. And, and you, it, what's interesting this is the foundational is, experience, which I mean, is also to be backdated. This and in, in, in all this, this sermon, too, I mean, you see the point of, was basically to concentrate all of this authority in one person, that one person at this point being Brigham mm -hmm. Young. And basically say, yeah, Joseph had all this, too. And he, you know, this, but he just forgot to Joseph tell Smith you that ever publicly claimed any of this for himself. <laughs> oh so here's there. Orson Pratt claiming it on behalf of Brigham Young. I think that Orson Pratt and Brigham Young, you know, bumped heads quite a bit and uh neither was very fond of the other so i think that probably brigham young assigned orson pratt to make this announcement to the world <laughs> sort of because he, he knew he was more eloquent he was uh more into theology and coming up with various theories and things but um i'm sure that orson probably from what i read probably had some reservations about having to wholeheartedly say yeah brigham has all the keys yeah, and powers this now this guy <laughs> now, but it was sort of, uh, I guess it was sort of like, I, I won't get into that, say it's like some some Republicans and Trump. You just don't want to um, <laughs> upset the, the guy in charge. Yeah. But, they, um, they were doing ceilings in Nauvoo um, prior to leaving, and they would seal, you know, they had law of adoption. They would also, mm -hmm. uh, we know that wives were sealed to Joseph Smith and to Brigham Young in, in the Nauvoo temple. What what power were they claiming to use as part of that ceiling or to perform the ceilings or where did Again, it come from? I, I suppose this, but it's according, you know, it's so Brigham Young, when the when he and the apostles that followed him and not all the apostles did, their claim to it being the ones to to lead the LDS church was that they were part of the anointed core. 
you know, they had the keys and all the stuff and given to them. And they, because of that, they had, they had keys and they could lead the church. Now the anointed now, quorum had women in it. Well, you go, which is interesting because hmm. Emma Smith was co-president with Joseph Smith of the anointed quorum, which would mean Hmm. Later on, she could have turned around and said, well, I actually was the president or co-president of the anointed quorum. So the RLDS church, you know, right. she legit too. Yeah. but she never did. Wow. Um, so they were performing the ceilings, but they certainly weren't saying these ceilings are possible because of Elijah and returning. Yeah, it may they have just all thought between, they had I, power. My, my, my view is I think that the story on the development of what became LDS polygamy in Utah. And it's in Utah. I what was happening in Nauvoo, I think it's still really, I don't think we know everything yet. <laughs> I for instance, Fanny Alger is usually pointed out as being Joseph Smith's first wife. And mm -hmm. I, they would have been sealed if indeed they were sealed in what, 1835, 1834? Well, that would have been before this. Before Elijah ever came, yeah. yeah. And I personally think that Fanny Alger was just an affair. I also think yes. that, that Nancy Rigdon was just, he was just propositioning her. Right. I don't think there was any, because she said he never mentioned marriage to me. That's sort so, of a later thing. Yeah. So this is all happening at the same time. So Brigham Young was not the pr president of the church when the saints came over to Utah. It it was later, and I'm not sure what the date was, but that's what when it we was started. when they took over the the quorum of the twelve as a body were to right. lead the church with Brigham as the president. They went to Utah. They settled there. They made that initial trek to Utah. Got everything set. Then Brigham went back to far west, where the majority of the Mormons were camping out and had been camping out for a couple several years. And uh, not far west. I'm sorry. Uh, Winter oh, quarters, Nebraska. Yeah. Council Bluff. And it was there then that he called a special meeting of everyone. And a lot of the apostles weren't there. The apostles that really butted heads with him the most, Orson Pratt, Parley V. Pratt, John Taylor, they weren't present. They were other in other places. And that's basically where Brigham Young said, listen, he started talking about he had a dream where Joseph Smith basically came to him. And he basically said, you know, I hold the keys and I, uh, you know, you need to make me the president of the church. And it was there that he became president. And that's when we start getting all of the the writings about how he looked like Joseph Smith. E even later than that, th those stories come even later. Those come out, I think, in the 1860s or 70s even. I mean, those so a are lot of this is to just build up Brigham Young, build yeah. up the presidency, make Create somebody look powerful. Yeah. And right. to give an excuse for why we're bringing in in polygamy, uh, and and this makes him the most powerful man in in her. church <laughs> because he's the one who says whether you can marry another wife or not. Right, he and of course makes he wanted. Decisions. And of course, a lot of the L modern modern day LDS church members say, "Well, you had to get permission." N you you did, but. He had to get permission the same way he needed a temple recommend. The church wanted every man to be a polygamist. You know, if you, if a man wanted to take another wife and, you know, and he pretty much would get permit, could get permission. And Brigham Young for the rest of his life basically condemned the 60 some percent of Latter-day Saint church members who did not practice polygamy. He went so far as saying the only men that will ever become gods, even the sons of gods are polygamists. And then, and there was also thought that, you know, if you do not practice polygamy, your one wife that you love, you're going to lose her. She'll be given to a polygamist for a man who's more devout, who has, who is a polygamist. I so I mean, it was always the intention that every Mormon man be a polygamist. Right. And we, the only church that backtracked from that throughout the 20th century and certainly today saying, oh, it was only just certain people. You had to be called. Yeah. You no, know, everyone was called to, to, to practice this. Well, my ancestors yeah. certainly were. That's for sure. Yeah. We're only on our third slide. Yeah, man. but this, this is fascinating. We, okay. so, 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 like blown the, away. <laughs> so back in, in uh, and it was Easter Sunday, eighteen thirty-six, when when you know this this vision took place, according to uh yeah to the records. But what did okay Oliver Cowdery? He was also one of the, the ones. They don't mention him in here. He had been dead, but for two years by this point. In 1852. But he was also the one who received these keys, supposedly. So what did Oliver Cowdery say about all the keys and authority that he had received? 
Let's go to the next slide. This is his very last testimony, and this was written to Elder Samuel W. Richards, July 13th, 1849. It was later, much later, uh, printed in the Approvement Era back uh, in 1898. And this is Oliver's testimony of the restoration of all the priesthood keys that he had. While darkness covered the earth and gross darkness the people, along the authority to minister in holy things had been taken away, the Lord opened the heavens and sent forth his word for the salvation of Israel. In fulfillment of sacred scriptures, the everlasting gospel was proclaimed by the mighty angel Moroni, who clothed with authority of his mission gave glory to God in the highest. The gospel is the stone taken from the mountain without hands. John the Baptist holding the keys of the Aaronic priesthood. Peter, James, and John holding the keys of the Melchizedek priesthood have also ministered for those who shall be heirs of salvation. And with the administrations ordained men to the same priesthood, these priesthoods with their authority are now and must continue to be in the body of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. <clears throat> blessed are the elder who has received the same, and thrice blessed and holy is he who shall endure to the end. Anyway, that was his final testimony, and this was just a few months before he died. Again, and this was three years almost before the announcement of polygamy. And Oliver Cowdery was not in Utah. He had lined him. He had, uh, basically parted ways with Joseph Smith, I think in 1838, but in 1848 had joined with the Brighamites. But he had not, because of health issues, had not yet migrated to Utah. But he missed, lists all these people, but there's somebody missing. Yeah. Elijah. I was just going to say that. that. That would be the culminating event, I would think. Right, that would be the you've culminating the event. Right. And then you've got the ceiling keys, the yeah. foundational doctrine, and he doesn't even mention it on and his then, deathbed. This, this concept of Elijah coming from the great dreadful day of the Lord. Of course, that is the last passage in the Christian New Testament, because in the New Testament, uh, in the Christian Bible, Malachi has moved to the end of the Old Testament. And that sort of sets away for us. In the Hebrew Bible, Malachi is mixed in the middle there. And uh, it uh, doesn't end the he Hebrew Bible. But this idea of Elijah coming before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, both Christianity and, and in Judaism, was something that's supposed to be happening at the very end of time. It's like, you know, the final judgment. And in that whole event, Elijah is coming. It's not something that really happens way before that. Anyway, what's interesting about this, here's Oliver Cowdery's last testimony, testifying to the priesthood and all the keys, Elijah is missing, as well as any reference to sealing power or anything like that. And that was in 1849. So now let's go work our way back and look and see what some things that Joseph Smith said about Elijah and the keys. I, I, I wanted to point out here again, we see there's no mention of a first vision either. Not that he no. participated in it, but he never no. talks about it. Again, it's the angel Moroni, yeah. which... Seems to be what everybody references is the angel Moroni coming. They never talk about God the Father. Yes. Yeah. Jesus we'll, Christ yeah coming. A little bit later on, when we look at a first edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, we'll, that'll, I'll touch upon okay. that too. Yeah. But okay. So this is uh, Joseph Smith, January 2nd, 1844, nearly eight years after the Kirtland edition. And uh, what I should talk about today, I know what Brother Cahoon wants me to speak about. He wants me to speak about the coming of Elijah in the last days. I can see it in his eyes. I'll speak upon that subject then. The Bible says, I will send you Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes, that he shall turn the hearts of fathers to children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And now, the word turn here should have been translated bind or seal. But what is the object, the important mission, and how is it to be fulfilled? The keys are to be delivered. Mm -hmm. The spirit of Elijah is to come. The gospel to be established where the saints of God gathered in Zion is supposed to be built up. Again, he's talking about it as if it's something to come in the future. It's future tense. And this was yeah, recorded by tense. Wilfred Woodruff. He wrote this yes. down. But it's all future tense. It has not right. happened yet. And you this know, year again is... 44. This is eight years after the Kirtland vision. Yeah. Okay. So the supposed okay. Kirtland vision. Yeah. yeah. And before the alleged. Announced, the alleged, <laughs> but we have to say alleged. And he's talking about it completely as if it will happen someday. Again, get And this is what Joseph Smith is very much in line with mainstream Christianity and mainstream Judaism. That the coming of Elijah is something that happens at the end of time. Like that one of the very last things that's happening. You see, the Lord coming in the clouds, and there's Elijah too. That sort of thing. It's not this 
Elijah shows up to basically set up your denomination and give you some authority. <laughs> I mean, that's not what was ever visioned. Maybe that was Elias, right? Maybe that was supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. Elijah hasn't come. Only Elias has Only come. Elias. Oh, my gosh. Yes. <laughs> we should probably know, explain you know, that joke. I mean, it's not really a joke. Uh, and it's funny because Elias, the name Elias actually is, is another uh, translation of the word of the name Elijah. Right. But if you do look in uh, one of the earlier sections of the DNC, when Joseph Smith is giving the genealogy of how Moses got the priesthood, he gives it from his father, Jethro, who got, had the Melchizedek mm -hmm. priesthood, who then got it from a line of people. The last one was a fellow named Elias. Anyway, mm -hmm. that's their workaround. Uh, can, can it's I, not can a can mistake I go back? by Joseph Smith saying that Elijah and Elias are different people. It's a totally different Elias. I get it. Right, exactly. Can I go back just one here, Rob? Um, sure. So Oliver Cowdery talks about John the Baptist and Moroni bringing Peter, James, and John. He doesn't address Moses either, who supposedly showed up mm -hmm. in the no. Kirtland Temple as no, well. Right. No. So no reference to Kirtland and what happened there at all. Elijah, Elias, Moses, the Savior, none of that is on the deathbed statement um, by Oliver Cowdery no. in 49. Okay. So go back a little bit further to what Joseph Smith was saying, August 27, 1843. And this is seven years, four months after the Kirtland vision. How shall God come to the rescue of this generation? He shall send Elijah. The law revealed to Moses and Horeb never was revealed to the children of Israel. And he shall reveal the covenants to seal the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. And that was recorded by Willard Richards. So again, seven years, four months after the Kirtland vision, he's still speaking about it in future tense. Future tense. Wow. He's not ready to reveal it yet. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> like the first vision, not ready to reveal it yet. Yeah. <laughs> okay, go back to the, let's go to the next oh, one. Okay. Now we go to August 13th, 1843, seven years, three months after Kirtland. And Joseph Smith's preaching, this is in the history of the church, the world is reserved unto, unto burning in the last days. He shall send Elijah the prophet, and he shall reveal the covenants of the father in relation to the children, and the covenants of the children in relation to the fathers. Okay? Again, that was seven years, three months after Kirtland. It's still something that he's looking forward to coming in the future. October 3rd, 1841, five years, six months after the Kirtland vision. The dispensation of the fullness of time will bring to light things that have been that have been revealed in former dispensation and also other things that have never before been revealed. He shall send Elijah the prophet, etc., and restore all things in Christ. Again, that's tying Elijah coming as in, you know, restoring all things in Christ, sort of like the wrapping up of everything, the resurrection, all of this. It's not, it's something very different than what is presented. In the standard LDS narrative now. So you so, feel that this was just uh, your standard exhorting end of times. Uh, end standard, of the world's coming. These are coming. Yes, this standard is what's Christian happen. oration had nothing to do with a special visit to you know bestow keys for a polygamous purpose. This was just the end is coming, and Elijah. It was just yeah. spouting off what every preacher of the day would talk about with Elijah. Yeah, it's going to be a wonderful thing. You know, mm -hmm. Jesus is going to come back. Elijah is going to restore all that. You know, it's, you know, it was all, that was all part of this sort of apocalyptic, mm -hmm. apocalyptic vision that a lot of American evangelicals and fundamentalists right. and Latter-day Saints, a lot of the sort of the weird sects of the day were, were, were counting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so in other words, it's what's supposed to happen on April 8th of this yes. year. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Gosh, that, that's like a week from now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We'll, we'll know by then. I know. <laughs> this may not have even aired it. by then. <laughs> Maybe this will never air because it is the end of the world. Yes, if we're not here, everyone, it's because the end of the world happens. So. Yeah. <laughs> now, the, another reference appears in the second edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, which was published in Nauvoo in 1844. It was published a few months after Joseph Smith was killed, but he had approved everything to go into it. And they had added three or four new sections. DNC was originally published in 1835. This was the second edition. What was added to here was a section, uh, well, now is section 128. And uh, this is verses 21, and this is 20 through 21. And this is from a revelation or actually an epistle that is was written uh, on April 6, 1842 by Joseph Smith. And again, he's sort of doing what Oliver Cowdery did in his last testimony. He's sort of referring to 
all the keys and the visitations and things that he has received, that the Latter-day Saints have received up until that point. So he says, what do we hear? Glad tidings from Camorra. Moroni, an angel from heaven, declaring the fulfillment of the prophets, the book to be revealed. A voice of the Lord in the wilderness, Fayette County, Seneca, Fayette, Seneca County, declaring to the three witnesses to bear witness of the book. The voice of Michael on the banks of the Susquehanna, detecting the devil when he appeared as an angel of light. The voice of Peter, James, and John in the wilderness between Harmony, Susquehanna County, and Colesville, Broome County, on the Susquehanna River, declaring themselves to possessing the keys of the kingdom and the dispensation of the fullness of time. And again, the voice of God in the chamber of old Father Whitmer in Fayette, Seneca County, and at sundry times in diverse places through all the travels and tribulations of this Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And the voice of Michael, the archangel, the voice of Gabriel, and of Raphael, and of diverse angels from Michael or Adam down to the present time, all declaring their dispensation, their rights, their keys, their honors, their majesties and glories, and the power of their priesthood, giving line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, giving us consolation by holding forth that which is to come. Again, there's Elijah. God. Jesus, Where's Elijah? Elijah, he doesn't yeah. mention. I mean, Elias, yeah, I, mean Moses. I, I don't know if any. I know of no record of Raphael <laughs> appearing to Joseph Smith, but he he, he yeah. talks about that. But where is Moses? Where is Elias? Where is Elijah in the keys? Where is God the Father and my Son? Here you Jesus know. Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Unless that is unless that which holds forth of that which is to come. All that was to come. Yeah. Anyway. So, um, so that was um, what Joe. That's all we have from Joseph Smith on it. Okay, you go to the next slide. This is actually, I believe, the source. So when you say this is all we've had from Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith never wrote about Elias, Elijah, Moses. or Moses appearing to him. He in never. He never. No. No. He himself never no. wrote it. Never said it. And anyone else recorded he talked, it. He, he that would talk about right. Elijah, but it was always in the future tense. Okay. Yeah. So so no first town account that Joseph himself wrote it down today in the temple no. he appeared, and nothing that anyone else recorded. I heard Joseph say that he saw yeah, okay. Elijah. The only Elijah. thing we would have would be this revelation that uh of this manifestation of Elijah in the Kirtland Temple that Orson Pratt referred the to. Orson Pratt. Where did that come from? What, where, what is he looking If you go to the next slide, we'll see. This is like a mystery. This is incredible. Warren Cowdery was Oliver Cowdery's brother. He also sometimes wrote in the the journal, the the, the journals, the the diaries, the journals, the histories that were being kept for Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith did not do his own writing. He relied on on you know secretaries basically. But shortly, sometime, we don't even know the date. Sometime after April of eighteen thirty six, Warren wrote this in the official like journal that he kept for Joseph. The veil was taken from their minds and the eyes of their understandings were opened. They saw the Lord standing upon the breastwork of the pulpit before them. And his voice was the sound of rushing waters, even the voice of Jehovah saying, I'm the first and the last. I've admitted some of this. Let the hearts of your brethren rejoice and let all the hearts of the brethren people rejoice who have with their might built this house to my name. For behold, I've accepted this house and my name shall be here. And he goes on to say, after this vision closed, the heavens were opened again unto them, meaning Joseph and Oliver, and Moses appeared before them and committed unto them the keys of the gathering of Israel from the four parts of the earth and the leading of the ten tribes of the lands of the north. After this, Elias appeared and committed the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham, saying that in them and their seed, all generations after them should be blessed. After this vision closed, another great and glorious vision burst upon them. For Elijah the prophet, who was taken to heaven without tasting death, also stood before them and said, Behold, the time has fully come, which was spoken of by the mouth of Malachi, testifying that he should be sent before the great and dreadful day of the Lord to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, lest the whole earth be smitten with a curse. Therefore, the keys of this dispensation are committed into your hands, and by this you may know that the great and dreadful day of the Lord is near even at the doors. So that was recorded by Oliver Calvary's brother at some point after April 
of 1836. But we and don't we know when. We don't know when. Exactly. We don't know. It's, it's in there. We don't. Just at some point. There's no date in it. But by November 7, 1843, Willard Richards, who by that point was helping compile an official history of the church, went in, found this, and changed the wording to the first person. So that it became our eyes were open and we saw, and they said, you know, Elijah said to us. See, and that explains when we were at the Church History Museum, because the very nice senior missionary guide, you know, he seemed to be sure that it had been written down by Joseph or Oliver Cowdery in the first person, because I specifically asked that, but he couldn't tell me exactly where he was going to try to look it up. It was not written down in first person. No, in it fact, was written in they, third person and changed by Willard they Richards. They never the referred to it. They never referred to it. That's what I thought. I couldn't and, be surprised anyway, by like one more thing. The and <laughs> notice that, that there's talk of keys and all here, but the keys of gathering Israel, the keys of the dispensation, or years. But there's nothing about sealing. And even the concept of sealing, LDS think about sealing families together. The concept of sealing is also a Christian concept. Yes. It's, a, it's in the New Testament. It's the idea a person is sealed. They're protected from the earth. They are sealed to God. So that regardless of what happens to them on this earth, they God will claim them. They have a claim on Christ. That's what sealing is in the standard right. Christian. Christian yeah, and, and that's very word. true. It actually means sort of like protected or yeah. or you're assured in, in this confidence that God has you in his yeah. hand. You're a phrase that Joseph Smith is sealed up into yes. eternal life. Yes. Which basically, okay, yes. you're you know, you you you're saved. You you're saved. It you're, is you being know, saved by the grace yeah, of God. Endure well, to you the can't end get and you'll more be saved. Christian than that. And of course, yeah. being saved by grace was a dirty word in the church up until probably about 15 years ago. Yes. So that's very interesting. <laughs> What do you think, so, Landon? I see you uh, kind of like holding your pen, going. Hmm. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm trying to look at this. Um, so Warren wrote in Joseph's journal as the scribe. He, yes, but and there's nothing. But it's not dated anywhere. It, like, is it squoze in between certain dates? I mean, usually when you write a journal, you would say, "Oh, it's you know, in between yeah, dates." Like a freestanding it, it, piece of paper. There's no way. No, no, it's in the journal. Though. There, there's recordings of like. Um, of things happening with with the, the temple being dedicated and all of that, and you know, th but this was added in there. But there's no date. This is the only section in his handwriting, and there's no date attached to it. So, so we, know, we know it was sometime after April 26 or 27th of 1836. We know, you know, it could, it could have been a few days later. It could have been that night. It could have been three months later. We don't know. But nobody else knows anything about this. Uh, this was never published. This was never did Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery. Again, who was still, he was still one of the leaders of the church. They never preached about it publicly. Did this happen? They never told anybody that it happened. Did Did Warren stay with the Brighamites or did he left he it all? He, he left it all. <laughs> he, he left a few years later just chanting with all of them. I so, so he would have had, he probably would have written this sometime before the Saints ever left yeah. within the year right. after I'm not, I'm not really sure when he when he left the church i mean i know that within two years oliver cowdery was gone right. so so, so apologists could uh, say well he's joseph's scribe joseph is telling him this story and he's writing it down sure but then but of course the more egregious part is that to give it more if that happened the more egregious part to give it more weight is that then Willard Richards goes back and puts it in Joseph's own voice because yeah. that gives it more credibility. And, and wait, is then, that kind of what you're the, thinking, The Landon? point is that even if that it was the case, that could have been the case. I mean, that's a perfectly rational explanation. Joseph, mm -hmm. oh, this happened to us, write that down too. Look, I'm but he and all, neither he nor Oliver ever talked right. about it. <laughs> and when they did talk about Elijah, it was always in the, in it was in going to happen future. in the future. It did and not when happen both before. of them, cited all the keys and the messengers to the given them the keys, Elijah wasn't listed. Hmm. Including in the 1845, 1844 edition, the second edition of the Doctrine and Covenants. In that section we looked at a few moments ago, Elijah is not mentioned in there. Is this the reason um, that Community of Christ doesn't really share this narrative? Because they do not believe this really happened. They may have believed it in Rehab, but again, look at what is missing from even this testimony. There's nothing about sealing keys. Mm. There's nothing about sealing. There's nothing about marriage or, you know, any of that in this. 
Yeah. So uh, there's certainly nothing about polygamy Mm-mm. in it, but uh, the, you know, it's there's nothing about eternal marriage in this. There's mm-hmm. nothing about you know temple ordinances or anything like that in this. All of that is sort of being read into it by Latter Day Saints, or will be read into by Latter Day Saints decades later in the future, and now almost two hundred years later. Yeah, but it's not not actually in even Warren Calvary's account. So there seems to be a lot of stuff that's written down that nobody's talking about. Mm-hmm. For instance, the first visions written by Joseph in 1832, yeah. published in 1838, the official one, yet nobody in the time is ever talking about a first vision. Even no, after actually, we have the written thing, they're still right. talking about it's an angel. Yeah. 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 And, and I think the, the, the first the, vision, my understanding was that was first published or first made public and the Pearl of Great Price, which I believe was published in Liverpool and was actually like a missionary booklet. Mm-hmm. And then it later, like in the late 1800s, that was um, canonized as LDS scripture. But it really, the first vision, getting off topic here, but in after the uh, Reed Smoot hearings, or in light, Joseph F. Smith began, and the church began going back east, and building and buying up historic properties like the Smith family farm and the birthplace of Joseph Smith. And they began reconstructing the Mormon narrative of the the Trek West. Up until then, Mormons were seen as anti-American and they they basically were going to Utah to get away from the U.S. And so after the Reed Smoot hearings and after Joseph F. Smith was under a lot of heat probably from some people in the church and certainly from the public by from some of the things he said under oath during the Reed Smooth hearings, there became this concerted effort under his administration to basically, we got to retool our history. We got to basically look at like the Puritans coming over and founding Massachusetts Bay and New Jerusalem. We need to follow that lead and basically present it that we were persecuted and that we settled Utah, and we were part of the movement west of America, Manifest Destiny, and that we've always been good Americans. And we are going to start reclaiming these historic spots on the East Coast, in New England, in the area that was settled by the Puritans, and in upstate New York, and those places. And so at that point, the story of the first vision started gaining a lot of traction. But we're talking like 1905 to 1910 that yeah, 70 80 years later yeah. if you had talked in especially during joseph smith's time if you had talked about the first vision they would have understood you to be talking about uh the february 1832 vision of the three degrees of glory that was the first vision as far as anyone knew in the 1830s and early 1840s in fact it was called the vision in the doctrine and governance at that point so it's kind of all about um buying up the properties, controlling the narrative, buying the document. And that's exactly, um, and that's what, they, and, and that's, the Kirkland that purchase That fits into is, what is, they have just done. This is no different from what they have always done. They control the narrative by controlling the sites and yes. controlling the documents. Yeah. So the question <laughs> is, then how did this thing that we're encountering, when did that come into the DNC? And so if we go to the next slide, I wanted to show a little bit about, this is a, a uh, you see this, I'm holding up. This is the reproduction of the first Doctrine and Covenants. The Doctrine and Covenants, there was an 1835 edition and there was an 1844 edition. They were both virtually the same. Uh, A couple of, I think there was a section about the martyrdom that was added to the 1845 edition that John Taylor had written. But uh, the first portion of the Doctrine and Covenants was the lectures on faith. That was the theology of the church, more or less. And then there was the first section, which is the same as it is in the LDS, current LDS section. And then the second section was actually what I believe is now section 20 in the LDS Doctrine and Covenants, but it was section two. And this was laying out the history of the church, the Doctrine and Covenants, the original 1835 edition and the 1844 edition did not lay the sections out chronologically. It was all organized by, it's by subject matter. And so the very first section, after you get that first section, the introduction, you get to section two, and it gives a history of the church. And it's interesting because it doesn't say the restoration of the church. It says, and it still says this in the, the, the LDS DNC, the rise of the church of Christ in these last days. To me, that, that, that reads very differently. 
than restoration of a church. You think of people rising up, of a community rising up, you know, as opposed to an institution being restored. And then it goes in here and basically it tells about when it was organized, what day of the week and month, according to the law, that Joseph Smith was ordained a prophet and uh, Oliver Cowdery. And basically that they are the first and second elders of the church. And, and then it sort of gives a brief history of Mormonism. After it was truly manifested to the first elder that he had received a remission of his sins, this is Joseph Smith having a come to Jesus experience, he was again entangled in the vanities of the world, but after repenting and humbling himself severely through faith in God, ministered unto him, and this is by a glorious angel appearing, and that was the appearance of Moroni. So it, basically the church's origins are tied up in the Book of Mormon coming forth. So that's section two of the first edition, the first two editions of the Doctrine and Covenants. So if you go to the next section, which would be section three, go to that next slide, the next section was done on priesthood. So they've told you in that first section how the church was founded. They also told in that first section how they do baptism and how they administer the sacrament, communion. The next section, section three, is on priesthood. There are two priesthoods in the church, and it goes on basically laying out how the priesthood is organized. Go to the next slide to section three. Same thing. It's a revelation on priesthood. And so basically everything it's done by, if you picked up this edition, the first two editions of the Doctrine and Covenants, it was basically conceived as a handbook where anybody could pick the Doctrine and Covenants up and they could understand basically what the theology was by looking at the doctrine at the lectures on faith, understand a little bit about the history, and then the organization of the priesthood, the church. And then you got into the revelations, which again were categorized by 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 subject matter, not chronologically. So that was the first two editions. That when Joseph Smith was killed, this was the edition that was in use. And this 1845 edition, which followed the same product, was in use by the LDS Church and by the community and by the RLDS Church when it was formed in 1860. They both used the same doctrine and covenants until 1864, when the RLDS Church issued a third edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, their first, but it was the third edition. And if you go to the next slide, what they did that was different, they started putting things in chronological order. So you had that first section that was introduction, and then section two was all about, you know, Martin Harris having lost the, trans the, the 116 pages, and it's the revelation to Joseph Smith, basically reprimanding him for that, but saying not to, not to fear, this will all be taken care of. And if you go to the next section, the next slide, section three, again, is about uh, Joseph being reprimanded for giving Martin Harris the, the translation. And then the next section, which I don't know if there's another slide after this or not. I don't think there is. Okay. Yeah. So this, this is a revelation to so Joseph is, Smith. This is the RLDS version. Yeah. And so no. in Utah, they don't have this. This is not okay, what all, all of these now. All of these are in the Utah edition now. Now but, they are in a different the, order. For yeah, they were but, not. Okay. but they're in a different order. So okay. what? So the RLDS they they are publishing their their DNC in 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 eighteen. Uh, I'm sorry, eighteen sixty four, and they're doing everything in chronological order. In doing that, they are establishing a narrative for the church, and that narrative begins with the Book of Mormon. It begins with the translation of the Book of Mormon. And of course, because the first sections of the DNC are base of their DNC is basically the, the revelations where Joseph where Joseph is being chastised by God. You know, he doesn't become this paragon of virtue. He's basically presented as a fallible human being who is making mistakes and who God is chastising, but promising, you know, it'll all work out. So that's that's the narrative that the, the RLDS church is putting out there. <laughs> Okay, so that was in 1864. In 1876, 12 years later, the, the LDS Church publishes their edition of the DNC. Up until then, they are still referring to the 1844 edition. 
And if you go to the next, and this is the first section or section two in their DNC after you get to the preface. And it's an extract from Joseph Smith's history. And what's the first thing you read? What's the first first and the first revelation in the DNC? Behold, I will reveal unto you the priesthood by the hand of Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to the fathers and the hearts of the children to turn to their fathers. If it were not so, the whole earth would be utterly wasted at his coming. So the very open on LDS DNC beginning in, in the late 1870s, and that's what you get. It completely moves the narrative from focusing on the Book of Mormon to restoration or priesthood authority. And that became the distinctive thing with Utah Mormonism. Suddenly, the Book of Mormon took second, took a backseat to priesthood authority and the restoration of priesthood authority. And so here it says um, in the subheading, an extract from Joseph Smith's history relating the words of the angel Moroni to Joseph Smith. So, but prior to this being included in the DNC in the 1870s, yeah. we never heard that the angel no, Moroni no, said anything this, about Elijah. And then, and, and, this, and, and this introduction to this section, this is, I copied this from the, the current edition. I'm not right. sure what it was in the 1879 okay. edition, but okay. the, um, this was not actually anything that was written like in 1823 or according to 1823. This was taken from the history of the church the form, that it was begun. They began to formalize that in the late 1830s. I don't think they finished until like about 1855. But as we know, if you, there are tons of things you can read about this and research and books have been written about it. And there's tons of podcasts and things on it. But that official LDS history of the church was most of it was written after Joseph Smith's death. Mm -hmm. They went in and added mm -hmm. things and reworded things and, you know, combined this from a letter and this from a revelation or this from a diary entry. And they basically made this lack of the word correlated history of the church where priesthood authority was front and center. That they created this narrative. And because this is old by our standards, no one ever questions it. No. It, it is old. But it's not the, old enough because they did not right. talk about this a century before. So this is not in the RLDS version. No, no. no. It's, the, the, R, the RLDS has done something I think, very smart. Yep. They have not canonized, actually, like the first vision or the appearance of, of the angel Moroni. None of that has ever been canonized. They just have the Book of Mormon. The Bible, the Book of Mormon, their Doctrine and Covenants. But the account of where the Book of Mormon came from, how it came to be, is not canonized anywhere in their scripture. And is it a validity issue? They just can't be sure. Because no, they, 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 they just dating. never did it. Why, why would you do it? If they, I mean, you know, you read the book, you pray about it, you, you know, either believe it or you don't. You have a testimony or you don't. Or you, don't right. you know, and how does it matter how it came forth? Joseph Smith himself originally was very hesitant to talk about it. I think in 1831 or 32, Hiram at a conference of the church basically asked Joseph Smith to come forward and talk about how the Book of Mormon came forth. And Joseph Smith refused. He said it wasn't important. He said it wasn't important. Ooh, yeah. hold that date. We want to talk to you about that later. That's that's very interesting. Yeah. And so I can see just crafting that narrative. The RLDS, they have a different kind of narrative. Our narrative, the priesthood power. And it's number one, and it's, it's and that, and, that front. and so I feel like that is going to be something that is also front and center in the new tour of the Kirtland Temple. It's yeah. going to be very important to make sure everyone understands this is where our power originated. Yeah. Now, now this 1876 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, they ended up adding the LDS Church added about 26 sections. I'm going to go through all of them, but most of them have to do with sort of keys. Mm -hmm. priesthood power one temple they're, they're creating a narrative and it should also be noted at this point that the rlds are sending missionaries to utah they started doing that in the 1860s including joseph smith's own son and though a lot of mormons utah mormons did not go back with them quite a surprising number of early mormons did and a surprising number of lds stake level leadership did left Utah and went back and joined the reorganized church. But um, in this 1870, um, I'm sorry, 1876 uh, edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, so go to the next section that they added and uh, uh, the next slide. I've got one more question yeah, here, so question. Or, or at least a point. So the RLDS church 
does not believe in polygamy, they do not have to establish, they don't have to establish a ceiling power that was restored and that one man has the power to control. Right. And therefore, there's no need for the section two to be in their scripture or for them to add it. Obviously, it didn't right. exist to begin with. But for the LDS, we've had this talk. We've got Brigham Young. We have to establish the power by which polygamy. And I would say that that was the entire objective of this edition of the Doctrine and Covenants was to establish Brigham Young's authority and power and the cl claims of having those keys and and affirming polygamy as something that has always been a part of the church. We're and this was not a revelation. Testament. They took this and said, oh, we extracted this out of from the history it. of the church and we're going to put it in the revelation. Where yeah, Joseph so, so, never claimed that he, or there, nowhere in no. his writings did he ever say, Elijah appeared to me and no. gave me keys, or that he, well, he and might he, have said he's coming because he always talked about it in the future. Right. That's regular he, Christian rhetoric, though, for yeah. the right. end of the world. So, so, this, so that, that, that idea about the coming of Elijah is set up initially, and again, the wording is very is different, too, from the way it appears in the Bible. It's, behold, I reveal unto you the priesthood by the hand of Elijah the prophet. That's something very specific. And Joseph Smith did talk about Elijah's priesthood and, and things coming, but again, future tense. Here they're taking a future tense thing, they're putting it in the mouth of Moroni, or actually, as it says in the original document, you can see this in Joseph Smith's papers from which it was taken, the angel Nephi yeah. <laughs> says this to Joseph Smith. There's a question. Was it Nephi? Was it Moroni? It's well, according to the original thing, it's Nephi. It's say. Nephi. Yeah. <laughs> And according to the earliest things, it was a nameless angel. Yeah. I mean, could have been anybody. You can, see that. Be... you can see the end goal, what they have to achieve. Like you said, yeah. the power, the keys, the polygamy. And then you can see them scrambling to pull pieces of things together yeah. to create a flawless narrative that all of us never questioned, ever. There it was. Yeah. It's an old document. It's exactly, you know, it follows, but it isn't. It's crafted almost like yeah. a Frankenstein, almost like I would say the Book of Mormon is put together with pieces of things yeah. from everywhere. You know, what I do admire about the Joseph Smith papers, and I mean, when I first heard about that they were going to do this, like in 2005, I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm impressed with what they've done. They really have put the, the, the you know, pictures, photographs of all the journals and letters and things up there. And then they've dissected it and they have it footnoted, like who wrote what when. So, I mean, you can go again, Joseph Smith papers, all of this is right there. But they're not even hiding that. I guess they just assumed that probably most true blue devout LDS church members and are not going to take the time it. to do a deep dive into the nope. Joseph Smith papers. They'll never look for it. They'll wait for a podcast like this, right? Probably yes. not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But if you go to, go to the next slide, and this is what became section 13 in the Doctrine and Covenants. And this, again, was a one verse revelation, but taken from that constructed history of the church. Unto you, my fellow servants, in the name of Messiah, and this is John the Baptist talking to Oliver and Joseph. I conferred the priesthood of Aaron, which holds the keys of the ministry of angels and of the gospel of repentance and of baptism and thought of blah, blah, blah. But the whole thing was, this is, again, reiterating the things that keys and priesthood were given to them early on, and, you know, by, by John the Baptist. And of course, if you've done any study, you know that none of that was even talked about until about 1834 or 1835. That's uh -oh. what I was just going go going to go back where he's talking here. <laughs> Moses, he's Elijah, in. John the Baptist seems to be missing, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. Yep. They just so again, add he's the summing up where all need. the priesthoods come from yeah. and they're not there. They're not well, there until they yeah. need them and they realize they so, need them and then uh, they dig them up and they add them. They, right. they literally scotch tape it back in. <laughs> Go to the next slide. I wanted to show you, I'm going to just briefly hit a, a number of these sections that were added. So section 77, that was previously unpublished revelation from March 1832, no exact date. And that affirms that Elias will come to gather the tribes of Israel and store all things. Now, what's central about here in, in Utah, in Utah Mormonism, Brigham Young held the keys. Also, Utah was Zion. You were to gather to Utah. You were to gather there and live under the authority of Brigham Young, the priesthood, and all that in Utah. And so this whole idea of gathering 
suddenly became, became, it was always there in Mormonism. But even in Joseph Smith's time, you had saints gathering in Ohio, you had saints gathering in Missouri. Even when they were forced out of Missouri and went on to Illinois, there were still saints in Kirtland. There were saints back east. There were still some saints in New York State. They were still scattered in small congregations. But under Brigham Young, it was like, you come to Utah, you escape the world, and you come here. And you live here. So this concept of gathering was essential. And that's what's focused on in section 77, which is added. Section 88 was added. Well, one, that's one question, one question mm -hmm. there. It affirms Elias will come to gather the tribes of Israel and restore all things. But right. that was Moses that did that. Well, yes. Yes, but that's what the, what the revelation says. Yeah. Okay, so that's it's, it's still looking forward to a coming of of, of again, Elias has been of a coming of, of this. This is something that's going to happen. So that's that's the narrative that's being stuck into the narrative, into the already existing sections of the DNC. That's stuck in there. In section 85, they published previously unpublished revelation dated November 27th. And it says, God will send one you've heard is mighty and strong. Ah, send the the mighty house and of God. So dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's become very popular, of course, in fundamentalist yeah. circles. A lot of evil and atrocities yes. have been committed by people that feel they are the one mighty and strong. I would say this is one of the most dangerous passages. In well, Mormon guess scriptures. who now in if you were in a Utah Mormon and in the late 1870s, who do you who would you associate the one mighty and strong with? He's going to set the house in order. Bring young. Yeah, that's what he's doing. That's what he did. Anyway, first aid in this alludes oh, to the Old Testament story of Uzzah, who was struck dead when he tried to study the ark because he wasn't a priest authorized to touch it. The verse assigns the same fate to the man, quote, who was called of God and appointed, they who are of the high priesthood that are found to have apostatized or have been cut off from the church. Well, who would that have been? The reorganized LDS yeah. people. You know, a lot of their leaders, all of their leaders were people who were high up in the leadership under Joseph Smith. When, so, when we say yeah. these are unpublished revelations, they're just coming out of nowhere. Or do we have we copies of no, them? No, from they, they, they were not made. They were not made. They were not pu publicly published. They, they were in journals and things. And all. For instance, I didn't mention here, but also in here was the Civil War, the so-called Civil War prophecy yeah. from uh, December 25th, 1832. Uh, that was never published or made public in Joseph Smith's lifetime, mainly because when he wrote that or when he dictated that on Christmas Day of 1832, less than a month earlier, South Carolina was threatening to secede from the Union. And that was not resolved until March of 1833. But, and plus, the, the, the revolution doesn't talk about civil war. It talks about wars being poured out on over the whole earth, the whole earth going to into a state of war, beginning with a rebellion in South Carolina. Of course, that rebellion didn't take place in Joseph Smith's lifetime. And when it did take place in 1861, it didn't lead to world war. So, uh, but when the, the LDS church puts this in their DNC, of course, this is a decade or more after the Civil War has ended. Yeah. So you can read it now in light of this national tragedy that took place a decade earlier so they're retrofitting everything right the wow factor yeah. well i've always noticed when, the, when i first heard this was he predicted the civil war i remember when i first read it when i was like 15 or 16 i thought what well, there's nothing about a civil war and here's talking about world wars right <laughs> okay um section 109 was added that was the dedicate dedicatory prayer for the Curdlin house of the Lord. I use that wording because the word temple appears nowhere in the dedication. It's the house of the Lord. Yeah, and, and it's that's returning what to be over... the house of the Lord. Yeah, they use that all the time now. Yeah. I made that observation about a year ago. I'm like, watch for it. And it's Call over it the house of it, the Lord. It is over that. It's over yeah. the Curdlin temple, the house of the Lord constructed by the Church of the Latter Day Saints. I wonder how yeah. long that sign will stay there. <laughs> but we'll uh, see. anyway, <laughs> but again, this is now building up this dedicatory prayer which was never in the DNC before, has been, has been stuck in here now. Along with all these other, pre these three or four previous verses scattered throughout, looking forward to a restoration, talking about Elias coming, talking about Elijah coming. And then in section 110, you have Warren Calvary's third person account of Moses, the Lord, Elias, Elijah, appearing in the Kirtland Temple that's reworded by Willard Richard as a first person account. 
and no one's ever heard of Warren Cowdery. Like, like he's not mentioned anywhere yeah, else. He's I know. just gone yeah. to history. And now the account is in the first person. I, Joseph, yeah. saw Moses. I yeah. and saw again, Elias. All over it. I mean, what was written is they. And what right. was written is yeah. we saw. But again, we. where, where, is, where do Oliver Cowdery and Joseph Smith ever talk about this? They don't. Then section 11, which comes after that, is a previous unpublished revelation dated August 6, 1836. The Lord tells Joseph, concern you're not yourself about your debts, for I will give you power to pay them. And those debts were the incurred, were the ones incurred for building the house of the Lord in Kirtland. And, so, and of uh, course, we find that he did not give them the power to pay them. The, the temple was repossessed uh, yes, and he fled that. from. <laughs> and I, I, I think I think the, 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 the idea is concern you're not yourself about that temple is what is basically it seems to be saying to me. Oh, like it's yeah. OK to let it go. Kind yeah, of. You let it go. Don't yeah. concern yourself. I, you know, and I, I wonder about that because I feel like if you take the tour when community of Christ is there and you ask, why did they abandon this temple? I feel like they would tell you the truth. I feel like the senior missionaries, if someone were to say, why did they abandon this site or the temple? I don't think they would mention the banking crisis. I don't think they would mention this is an interesting thing. Latter-day Mormons never left Kirtland. There were still a handful of them all along. They never really did abandon the, the temple. There was when the majority of saints moved to far West Missouri and then to Illinois, there were still Mormons in Kirtland. They were still using the temple. Then they, you know, the small group there, I think they lost the taxes, not being able to pay taxes or right. whatever. And then Joseph Smith in the mid of the third bought it himself right. sometime yeah, after he changed hands a couple of times. I did yeah. a podcast about right. that. Here. But I mean, right. is at one point the Strangites were using it mm -hmm. in the 1840s. So there were always Latter day Saints, Mormons in Kirtland using the temple. It was never deserted the way. It has been in the LDS narrative. We're imagining, right. and, and of course, we LDS have the letters thing. or letter written from high by Hiram from Nauvoo saying, "You guys need to come here." We didn't mean this was a special land set apart. No, no, no. We meant over here, right? <laughs> so he's telling everybody to leave Kirtland, but some did stay. Yeah, it's a really yeah. interesting history. I mean, some of them couldn't afford to after after the the, the exactly the, the bank the anti banking society yeah. collapsing. They, they, were, they were too poor. They were yeah. poor all along. But I mean, that really did a lot of people in. Yeah. And where they, they couldn't afford to move. Yeah. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. I feel like this narrative is lost, though. We're <laughs> going to have to go back there, Landon. We're <laughs> going to have to take a tour and we're going to have to see what they're saying. <laughs> okay. So after you get uh, that, then you get the section 113. It's a question and answer thing. It's not a revelation. And it's basically asking for Joseph Smith's interpretation about the rod of Jesse and the root of Jesse. And they are identified as being servants of Christ and descendants of Ephraim, who by right hold the priesthood and the keys of the kingdom in order to gather Israel. And I think uh, one of them is identified by as, as Jesus. One is identified as Joseph. The other one is left unidentified. But if you're living in not in Utah and you're a devout Mormon, you're probably going to equate that probably with Brigham Young or at least the church hierarchy. So again, it's it's firming up that narrative that one man has the keys and the power, and he's here in Utah, and this is where you need to be. Section 115, Revelation, April 26, 1838. That's the, the Revelation changing the name of the church from the Church of Latter-day Saints to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And uh, in the, the end, this is God saying he has given Joseph the keys of this kingdom and ministry. Again, changing the name and also bringing this concept of keys into the picture. Section thir uh, 177, a Revelation, July 8, 1838, rebuking William Marks, Newell K. Whitney and Oliver Granger. Granger and Whitney died years earlier before this was published in the DNC. Uh, but William Marks was alive and he was in the first presidency of the reorganized church. Hmm. So what better way, again, to sort of take a stab at the reorganization? Let's print a revelation that had never been printed before from 1838, basically showing William Marks in an unfavorable light. And Even though he went on to become to be the president of the stake, you know. Exactly. The, the and then condemning the people that had already passed away. There was so much calling out <laughs> yeah. in, in the literature of the early church. It's just yeah. you were always, your name was there. You were condemned. You were let back in. You were condemned again. I mean, 
<laughs> they really did wield the pen like a sword as yeah. far as cutting people off and ruining reputations. It's very interesting. Yeah. Section 118 is a revelation that, again, it had not been published before, but from July 8th, 1838. And that's the revelation calling John Taylor, Wilford Woodruff, and Willard Richards as apostles to fill the places of those who have fallen. So again, these three guys, they're in, you know, they're in power in Utah. They, you know, they're apostles in Utah. So they said true to Brigham Young. So let's put a revelation there, putting them in a favorable light as far back as 1838. In section 120, it's a one-verse revelation, July 18, 1838, saying that the properties in far west Missouri that have been tied to the church were to be disposed of. Now, why would you put that all these years later in the DNC, except maybe to say Missouri doesn't matter so much right now. It doesn't matter anymore. Come to Utah. Again, it's building up the narrative that everything back east, walk we're away done. from it, come we're to Utah, gather to right. Utah. Mm. Then you have, a, I'm not going to get into this, this could be a whole podcast and itself, the, the so-called Liberty Jail Letter, which is sections 121 through 123. That was added. What's interesting about those, I'm not going to get off too much, is that the, the way most of those several letters are left out. For instance, the one section, I think it's 121, the description is a prayer of Joseph Smith and the voice of God coming back to him. If you actually read the what it comes from, it comes from a letter that Joseph Smith wrote to the leaders of the church. And the voice and the, uh, about, you know, the ends of the earth will, will, inquire, will inquire after you and you'll be blessed. That is Joseph Smith talking to the leaders of the church after reprimanding them for being coarse, gross, vulgar in their private conversations of being too, too fast to anger and bringing you know, persecution and murder upon the saints. He basically reprimands the church leadership, most of whom end up in Utah, for being hotheads, being prone to being violent. And uh, being angry and, you know, and, and manipulating people using followers. And but that that's, letter, left out of, that's all left out. That's left out. You know, we saw the door from the Liberty Jail just mm -hmm. yesterday. It is one of the artifacts that very quickly made its way to the Church History Museum. And it's there. You can go see that there. Yeah. We, we also saw, which was very interesting, uh, letters that Joseph Smith wrote. Some of them, a couple of them were from Liberty Jail. Yeah. And yeah. he had beautiful handwriting. He did have right. beautiful handwriting. And these letters that the, 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 these three sections were, came from in the DNC, in the LDS DNC, what is left out too is the praise he heaps upon Emma. That's yeah. all they'll say. <laughs> yeah, his very last letter that he wrote right before he died to Emma about family. But yeah, we did think it was interesting because the narrative, of course, is he can't write. He's He's uneducated. You know, uneducated. The more stupid rocks. you make him, the more valid his claims are. And which yet, here are these letters, my darling Emma. They were eloquent. Um, there was even some punctuation in the letters, which we don't often see from Joseph. So no. it was very interesting that those were on display because it definitely was counter to the narrative that he was uneducated. They seemed to well, be no, and in, Utah, in, 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 in Nauvoo, he was, yeah. especially, he probably got a lot of this from John C. Ben, but he started like throwing Latin phrases and yeah. doing this stuff. Yeah, you can't have it both ways. You, yeah, can't, yeah. you can't be an uneducated farm boy and writing letters like that. So I thought it was brave of them to put those on display because it definitely they you question the narrative. Yeah. No, Why it, make Joe Smith into a dummy? Yeah. You know? Exactly. It went so, the purposes, he can be uneducated, but then he also yeah. has to be brilliant because these are founding prophets. So, yeah. so do you know by any chance the letter where he's where he is? Uh, you just said he was talking bad about the twelve and and that. Yeah, I mean, it, these, is that these, what these, are, were those these, letters sold as part of this? Do you know? No, no, no. They're actually you, you can read the entire thing in the Joseph Smith papers. Just okay. go to Joseph Smith papers and uh, do a search for like Liberty J letter from Liberty Jail, okay. and it'll take you to these a number of these letters. And they are very long. They're very eloquent, and it just you see. Oh, they took this out. They took that out. I mean, the most famous thing I guess is what the others called the 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 covenant oath and covenant of the priesthood that you know the powers of heaven. Are the powers of the priesthood and you can't you can be ordained and set apart but you you know they can be conferred upon you but you can't use them unless you're actually righteous which right. sort of harkens back to the initial mormon idea of priesthood which was that it was charismatic it was a spiritual endowment it was a spiritual gift that came directly to the believer from god 
authority did. So Came did they actually take theory. sections out of letters and kind of rearrange it? Or yeah, did they, they, just, oh, they did. They did totally they just did. Cut these out sections the are basically they, they they took sections out of out of several letters and created really these three did. sections. So they're not revelations. They're compositions of multiple. They're letters Joseph Smith to writing epistles to, to, the, to the scattered leadership while he's in Liberty Jail. Saying, do this, so, don't do this. You need when to. you cut things out and put sections together, it changes the meaning. It changes the Of course it does. It changes right. everything. Yes. They, it, yes. <laughs> and all, you know, I guess probably compilers of all scriptures, including the Bible, have done that. The thing is, what is the narrative that you're trying to construct when you do that? What is the meaning that the reader takes from that? What are the values that you're trying to put forth in doing that? And I think in all of this, the values and the idea they were trying to put forth was Brigham Young, or the president of the LDS Church in Utah, is the only one that can authorize polygamy. Polygamy is essential. He has all the keys for everybody <laughs> on the whole earth. They need to come to Utah and basically come under his governance. Gather, you know, and that 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 was what they're trying to get out there and trying to show that the ones staying back east, whether it was uh, the Bickerton Knights in Pennsylvania or the, the reorganization in, in in Illinois and Missouri, that they weren't in the right place. They weren't following the guy with the keys. And and, and, the and leaders that's, and that many of their leaders were the people they were reprimanded by God earlier on. Right. So <laughs> that, that's why we always hear about the scriptures being changed and plain and precious things taken out. The reality is that the winner writes the history, and the things that are in the scriptures are what are put there by the winner to make the winner's argument the most plausible or the most believable yeah, or give it the most power. Mm -hmm. Which so, and then the answer to that is go back to the original Mormon concept, original that the individual was only beholden God, and you had to get your own personal revelation against about everything mm -hmm. and to study everything out. And don't just take something because it was a tradition. Question it. You know, toss out the foolish traditions of your father. All this is in the Book of Mormon. Right. But that those aren't the ideas. I mean, if you advocate those ideas organizationally, you're li liable to have chaos. Yes. And they right. did and that. That's what they arrived at eventually. They did. Yeah. And then they <laughs> and had so to they grab started. power back by yeah. changing in the fact, revelations to say, well, you can have personal revelation, but only to but if it only with me. Well, there's yeah. an example of that that just happened about an hour ago. Um, so a lot of people feel that they've had personal revelations now about how to wear garments, especially women. They felt, you know what, I really feel good about the fact that I wear it on Sunday and I also wear it to the temple. And a lot of people have cited personal revelation as their justification or reason that they feel that they can do this. Well, my favorite story yes. about this goes back to Brigham Young's day. One of his wives came to him and said, complaining because her daughters by him wanted to wear the fashionable clothes of the period, which were of low course. cut off the shoulder things, the shoulder little cleavage, and they didn't want to wear the garments. They wanted, they said, can we cut our garments so that we can, mm -hmm. you know, accommodate the fashions of the day? And Brigham Young sarcastically said, oh, yeah, sure, go ahead, cut them here, cut them there, cut them to pieces if you need to. And so the wife dutifully went back and said, your father said you have permission to cut them. And they did. <laughs> and they did. That's great. Well, what's interesting is because we're using personal revelation to say, I get to choose how I feel comfortable wearing the garment. Well, just today, big article in the Tribune. Yep. Nope. They are cracking the whip and hammering. You will wear them day and night. They have said no more personal revelation. It's <laughs> it's barely heating up. This is like breaking news. I'm sure by the time this airs, there will have been a huge firestorm over it. But again, personal revelation butts up against the organization, About as you said, and then the organization hammers down. It's the only way. And what's what the world what and will rightly laugh about this is we're talking about revelation about your underwear about your underwear your underpants. And Landon made the great point that just last week they told women in the church that we have more power and authority than any women in any other organization. Yet this week we are going to tell you what kind of underwear to wear and how often to wear it. So it's like they, they really your power and authority right there. I'm spicy. The people about this with the power and authority who I think are basically the the, the, the publicists yeah. really need to get their act together. Yeah. Because the 90 year old men. Yeah. They no, I, I honestly can't believe that this is happening a week after all of that. I and I almost feel it's a shot across the bow. Women, you're out of line. You made all those Instagram posts. You expressed 
you know, that you were not happy. And now we are going to remind you that you do what we say. That's how yeah. I take it. So, oh, yeah. Oh. And that, that thinks that's the women, but it's also to everybody. You know, yeah. when I joined the LDS church in the 70s, well, the, the father holds a priesthood and he's in charge yes. of his family. But no, you can't baptize your child, yeah. even if you're a devout member without your bishop's permission. Right. You can't confirm oh, them without his permission. You know, there are certain blessings you can't give without permission from the bishop or state president. I mean, yeah. it, it everybody's under the control of the organization. That is such a great point, Rob. Yeah. All right, should we forge ahead? We have yep, this is just bringing up there's, so there's much. There's more sections so that have been added. Relevant today, yeah. This is just amazing. Good heavens. Okay, this was section 125. This basically was from I take again March 1841 Revelation, but it was published for the first time decades later in the LDS DMC, and it's the will of God about basically who call themselves by my name or are saying to be saints to gather themselves together unto the places to which I shall appoint unto them and build up cities. So again, idea of gather to gather design. Yeah. Then in DC 127, the three verse revelation from March 1841 addressed to, and I love this, I had to keep dear and well-beloved brother Brigham saying, it is no more required at your hand to leave your family as in time past for your offering is acceptable unto me. Send my word abroad and take a special care of your family from this time henceforth and forever. Well, that was interesting <laughs> since Brigham Young was the president of the 12 apostles who had no authority anywhere except in the mission field under in Joseph Smith's lifetime. They were only had authority in places where there was not a branch of the church organized, where there was no state president, no state high council. They were a traveling high council in the in, wherever in the world there were church members, but no high council. Hmm. But, uh, but they it took also this, says... You stay in Utah and take keep right. control. Take care of your family. Yeah. Well, yeah. the other guys, you send them away where they aren't right. a threat to your so they're power. Not a well, and, you know, <laughs> take care of your family means building, you know, these mansions all over Salt Lake yeah. City. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah take care of your family. Yeah. And then section 31, to, it says to obtain the highest degree of glory, a man must enter the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. And then section 132 is of course the 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 revelation on polygamy which equates the new and everlasting covenant with polygamy and it says that emma hale will be destroyed for not obeying it the interesting don't thing of course is that it's not don't tell it, us that the new and everlasting covenant is not polygamy it is don't tell us that yes well what's what's interesting is this revelation of course joseph smith was dead within two years of this and you know emma lived to be lived a long and happy life actually <laughs> died in her she married her next husband um, and was October happy Smith's and they had some birthday. issues but she was happy but yeah, she, I, mean, yeah. She, I feel that's really interesting that you would marry your next husband on the birthday of your former husband that right and so means. maybe keep that locket of his <laughs> one photograph on your uh, on your being yep and then the last section that was added which was the last section of the ldsdc was section 132 which was Bre brigham young's revelation of the world word and will of god concerning the camp of israel and the journeys in the west so you look at the DNC as a, the LDS DNC that year, that first LDS edition, Utah edition. The first revelation is Elijah's coming to restore keys. Then you lead you through there. Priesthood's being restored. Keys are being restored. Kirtland, the vision, and then into polygamy is established. And then it ends with Brigham Young holding the keys and giving the word and will of the Lord as the saints move west. It creates the entire Mormon epoch, the, you know. And central to it all is priesthood authority, not the Book of Mormon. And on that point, when I joined the LDS Church in 1977, we studied the Book of Mormon. We didn't study it. We might read it as a proof text, but nobody actually really studied it in depth until Ezra Hat Benson came along. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yeah. That's true. Make the Book of Mormon new again. That's yeah. right. Go on, go on. Most important thing. Yeah, and the thing is, I actually think that's probably why a lot of people under the age of 50 and 45 are leaving the church, even if they don't come across historical stuff that causes a faith crisis, because the Book of Mormon itself, when I first read it, I thought, this is so kumbaya. And it's so take care of the poor, you know, you know, right. don't become violent, you know, bad, good, and bad. all that. And so if you if you but if you're raised in all that, sort of this this really traditional Christian ethos. It's really hard if you embrace all that, then to make room for a lot of the stuff that is currently happening or does happen in the church relative to truth claims and authority and all of this. Plus, just some of the policies of the LDS church seem so unchristlike. 
And so a lot of people are leaving, young younger people are leaving because of that. And I think it's because they basically, in having been required to study the Book of Mormon, they actually got into the teachings of Jesus. That is so interesting that yeah. people over a certain age were raised in a church that hammered authority like us. That's what we were raised in was the authority. Yeah. Younger people, you're saying, actually, accidentally, because <laughs> yeah, because the authority <laughs> said read the Book of Mormon, <laughs> Bible and Christianity, they actually had that. That is, I'm gonna have to think more so about. I, that. I think that that's my really opinion of why. Interesting. What I've, I'm a lot of very interesting. Left and you say, well, it just yep. seems so unchristlike. I've heard that from so many people who left. No, it's a different paradigm. It's an absolute different paradigm. Yeah. It explains why perhaps parents in our day could kick their child out, you know, for for whatever offense it was. Parents today, who were ones that were raised on these more Christian teachings, found inadvertently in the Book of Mormon, are saying, "I, I won't do that. I can't do that." Yeah, it's really fascinating. Well, it's it's where the, the LDS basically drive beginning of the eighties to become more Christian, to become a to become oh. their Christian church has yeah. sort of backfired because you can't have that you know the teachings of Jesus and have this sort of pharisaical power mm. structure hierarchy thing going on they're incompatible that was exactly the type of thing that Jesus in the old in the new that testament and in the book of mormon crazy. preaches against huh. that's are, an incredible concept rob yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely can i are these sections still labeled this way i mean i know 132 is still on there but have are these the same sections that we yeah. see today they haven't changed yes. since 1876 okay. right yeah, they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does it say in the sections of the DNC? I can't remember when they were added. I don't know if it does or not. If and we I don't have, the, I don't it, have the more recent edition of yeah. the DNC. So I, because they've they've always changed the introduction. Right. But I'm sure it doesn't say that. written in 41, added in 76. Oh no, no, they just it give it does the, not they just say give that. the date of when it was written. Yeah. yeah. Because that's the most and put it in, again, it. in chronological order so that you read the DNC, you think that it's something that's always been there. Right. That's, Whereas that's actually true. there were things that are attributed the written 1830s that no one knew about until the right. 1860s or 70s. Oh my gosh. And then if you go to the very last slide, because this whole talk of restoration pacing back to the Book of Commandments, which this now this was the first attempt to publish the Revelations of Joseph Smith in 1833, back when the church was called Church of Christ. Uh, and this is section four, verse five. And this is talking about the whole purpose of the Book of Mormon coming forth. And thus, if the people of this generation harden not their hearts, I will work a reformation among them not a restoration. And I will put down all lyings and deceivings and priestcrafts and envying strifes and adulteries and sorceries and all manners of iniquities. And I will establish my church like to the church, which was taught by my disciples in days of old. Now, that no longer appears in the Doctrine and Covenants. That was written out of the of the Revelation, or the Revelation was rewritten in 1835, once priesthood and stuff had been and all these offices have been introduced into the, into the Church of Latter-day Saints. And so this section basically is the basis of DNC 5 in both the LDS edition and the Community of Christ edition. But it's a rewritten revelation. If you actually go back to the revelation, the original publication, most of it that's currently in that section 5 is not in the original. And it's much more simple. And it talks about a reformation about Mormonism being a Reformation movement, not a Restoration movement. So this would be the ongoing Reformation. I was just going to say that. <laughs> well, what is an ongoing Reformation? The thing, is, the thing is, everybody knows that's what it actually is. <laughs> you know, every, It has and, to be, because everything yeah. changes and the goalposts have to be moved. And then the, right. we, we've always done this. Well, but, you, but, 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 you can't, but you can't have this authoritarian leader or leadership structure that you have in the LDS church with that. Right. Again, well, the past yeah. leaders can't be wrong, because if they're wrong, then they're who we get our authority from. What does that make us? Right. So you have to have this double think where we're just going to sort of ignore the past, but we'll quote it when necessary, but we'll rewrite it when necessary, because right. the past in this narrative is where we, that's the claims for our authority. Well, in, in order to have a restoration, you have to have John the Baptist, <laughs> Peter, James, and John. Yeah. Elijah, uh, Moses, Moses. Mm -hmm. Although Elijah. none of those, although, although none of those came on the 
the scene. That story didn't come into the scene until 1835. Yep. So you need all these guys to come back to restore it. And they, we find out now it's all backdated. So it was a reformation that became a restoration yes. when you Mormonism was started a at backdating all of these yeah. and telling a whole new story. Yeah. So yeah, Mormonism is a reformation movement, not a restoration movement. And the thing is, you know, the other branches of Mormon, the community of Christ, they're not into this whole authoritarian stuff. They never have been. The Bickertonites, they never have been. The Strangites up in Michigan, Wisconsin, they were for a few years, but then they drifted away from it too. So this whole idea of keys and authority and one person, all this stuff, that's just, that's not part of any other version of Mormonism other than in the LDS church and the breakoffs from the Utah LDS church. It came because of Brigham Young. The Brighamite, yep. he had to consolidate his power yep. Yep. to control the masses in Utah. And everything that you, in my opinion, almost everything you don't like about the church, the LDS church is this controversial, goes back to either the, the, the claims to being of a exclusive authority, polygamy, or the racism. That's oh, it. I'm sure I'm sure you're right. And I mean, to consolidate that power and authority, they had to reach back into the writings. They had to pick and choose what props up their narrative. And that's what we have today. And no one, most people don't realize that at all. So the people, the LDS probably who would go to the Kirtland Temple when the community of Christ, they would give this wonderful historical tour. But I've read a line of something. I never felt the spirit there. And people, yes. I didn't feel yes. it. It felt like a museum. Yes. And, uh, you know, it, it was in disrepair and it was not in disrepair. They were they were taken care of it just fine. They, they, there were some problems with the building. I mean, it's from 1836, but, uh, you know, they, they were taking care yeah. of stuff. And uh, they last time I was there, which was the weekend before the world started shutting down for COVID. I went there for a Sunstone Kirtland conference around the weekend of March 9th of 2020. Uh, that Sunday, I went down to the uh, LDS section, the uh, historic Kirtland. I was talking to some of the, the old elderly missionaries there. I said, well, we haven't been down there. Well, what, what story do they tell down there? And I said, well, they don't tell a story. They just tell the facts. I said, they're, they're not telling anything that would, you know, it, they, they don't have an agenda. They're just telling the historic facts. Yeah. Well, and that's a concern. Of course, the COC, they are not using it as a missionary tool. They yeah. are just telling a historical narrative. And of course, I believe now it really, it will be a missionary tool. But I, I always hated that when people said, I don't feel the spirit there. I read a post on social media where they said, oh, I just, I didn't feel the spirit in the temple. And then I went to Deseret Book or whatever the church books are. I felt the spirit there. Like, oh that's, my goodness. That's the spirit of commerce, my dear. That's the spirit, <laughs> that's of, the commerce, spirit of commerce. Of capitalism. Oh, that's not the spirit wonderful. of God or Elijah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, you, you have just brought up so much, Rob. This has just been incredible. I feel like we could take each of these slides and do a whole little mini podcast on it. Just the things that we covered, I feel, and, and maybe a lot of you out there, our listeners and viewers know this. I did not know a lot of this. Landon, did you know very much of this? No, no, I had, I had no idea that uh, yeah. I, I knew, I knew Peter James and John, the Melchizedek priesthood was backdated, backdated but yeah. I had no idea that uh, Elias, Moses, and all of the Kirtland uh, the Baptist, all of it was backdated, yeah. were backdated. Yeah. nor did I know about the, the consolidation. I, I knew Brigham Young consolidated his power, but I didn't know how he did it through all the, adding all these revelations to the Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, yeah, and I think it. Radio Free Mormon, I think, did a, I mean, what I think probably one of the best episodes of any podcast I've, I've ever seen, which was uh, on Brigham Young's coup. How basically, after the death of Joseph Smith, yeah, you know, there, there really was a coup. You know, Brigham Young and the 12 apostles, the, the members of the 12 apostles who chose to follow him, basically did pretty much stage a coup and took over, yeah. you know, did fool the majority of the saints living in Nauvoo, at least. But, um, well, it, they, it outvoted, they outvoted Sydney. They, you know, yeah. all in favor and the of the 12, well, like, 12 hands. Well, they, they, all and in and favor. Plus, it's a political coup. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the, 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 only, the only authority that the, the, the 12 had was over the over the 70s, who were the missionary troops. You know, yeah. if you went on a mission, you were ordained to 70. And so they basically ordained all the men 70s. <laughs> and that makes Whereas, sense. Well, I think, in fact, Landon, traveling. You, you were talking a little bit today about this idea that if if there are no keys, there is no Elias, there is no Elijah, nothing was brought back. I mean, think that through to its logical conclusion. What does that really mean? 
about Mormonism and being I think sealed it in the means temple. That what does the, that mean? Yeah. I think it goes back to the again the, that original impulse in Mormonism, which I think I think Joseph Smith was frustrated with the world around him. I think he was frustrated with his parents fighting all the time about religion. His father was a universalist, and even though he did folk magic, magic folk magic was sort of like pseudoscience too. So there was a rational streak to Joseph Smith Senior. There was Lucy Mack, who was probably depressive, and was a Calvinist, and. And then there was, you know, nobody talks about Mormonism springing, coming about because of the Enlightenment, the American Enlightenment, enlightened Christianity and reason. But, uh, you know, in the, for instance, the Declaration of Independence says all people are, cre all men are created equal. They're endowed with their creator. Well, that rubs right up against traditional Christianity and original sin, where nobody has any rights. You're a born sinner. You deserve to go to hell. How do you reconcile those two competing ideas? I think. That was a tension that all Americans who were religiously minded felt. And I think Joseph Smith felt it very intensely because of his family situation. And I think the original impulse was the individual has to go directly to God. You got to think these things out. You got to question your your traditions. You got to reject them if they don't make sense. And in the end, it's what type of person are you? Are you a good person? Are you kind? Are you merciful? You know? I mean, Joseph Smith defined later on, he said that he wasn't very righteous, but he said, I, I define righteousness, he defined it as being just and merciful. And um, you read the Book of Mormon, that's a lot of what it's about. You know, class, the way people are mistreated because of class or wealth or poverty or positions in church or in the government. So, I mean, there's that very egalitarian impulse that's in early Mormonism, too. And it could very well have gone, I think, probably the way of the, the, the Quakers, even, yeah. of just this personal revelation religion. Yeah, but until it didn't, it didn't. Until, until other didn't. people got involved. That's right. Do you have any final thoughts, Landon? This has just been absolutely fascinating. I appreciate this. Uh, I, I learned a lot, Rob. Uh, yeah. I know we asked you to throw it together pretty quick uh, yeah. when we saw that I the twisted his arm. Yeah. Temple had been you did twist, <laughs> and you start telling us, and it was like, oh, we've got to hear about this. So uh, very fascinating. And I, I think when we when we covered the Kirtland Temple a couple episodes ago, and and the purchase of it. This is exactly what we said. They didn't buy a building. They bought a narrative. Yes. And yeah. you can see that this is what they've always done, is they've changed the narrative mm -hmm. to fit whatever they're saying. And you can darn well bet they're going to change the narrative again to keep that, that whatever it is they're trying to sell, they'll make that the narrative of the of The, the bright spot is in this day and age with communication the way it is. The person who owns the property, they may try to control the narrative, but they really can't. That's why people were leaving the LDS. Because trip. everyone will pull this up and say, is that that's right. true? Yes. <laughs> like actually yeah. in the parking lot of the building, they'll probably go, that's yeah. not And plus the different. community of Christ yeah. historian, the, the historian for the community of Christ, they, they have always been actual trained historians, yes. <laughs> not you know, bureaucrats or lawyers who've been right. assigned. Or a missionary with a cue card. I know, yeah. although they're, but, but, yeah, they're so the, cute. the community of Christ scholars and all who are who are dedicated to getting to the truth of, of Mormon history and past, they're still going to be involved. They're still going to be they, their their denomination may not own the building, but they're still out there making their cases and doing the research and, and and finding things. And there's always you know the Joseph Smith papers. I mean, my gosh, I at some point I almost believe the church is going to get rid of that website because there's just too much there. I know. And that but that's I, a problem. There is too much there. So only the true hardcore historian is going to go through it and pull this stuff out. But I feel like the COC are kind of the keepers of the kingdom. They have the original mindset, the original document, you know, they know. They don't have that agenda that the LDS church did as it yeah. came West. So I do feel that I hope that they do remain a relevant player because I, I hope that so I hope much the scholars from both denominations can continue to work together because exactly. they really, they have in the last 30, 40 years, which yeah. is great. I hope that they will continue to do that despite what direction their denominations go or what the leaders of those denominations. So well, this has been, this has been 
way more than, than we even imagined. And, and as Landon alluded to, as we close here, it's true. Rob has all kinds of stuff going on and we're like, oh, this is such a timely topic. The temple, you've got to do it. So we just appreciate you so much for pulling this together. And so well, it was so concise. It was so thorough. I mean, I think our minds are blown and we're going to be thinking about this for a couple of weeks, if not more. So please, everybody leave us your comments. Had you even explored anything like this? Were you aware of back? dating? Were you aware of one of where some of these sections came from in the DNC? Were you aware at all of the, I would call it controversy now around the revelation and the appearance of Elias, Elijah, Moses, and the ceiling keys. This is so important and foundational. It's just to look into this it is really fascinating and speaks to the very heart of Mormonism. So please leave your comments and let us know what you thought about what Rob's wonderful presentation. Please like and subscribe to Mormonish Podcast. And if you'd like to be made aware of when new episodes come out, you can hit the notification bell and you'll be notified when there's a new episode. You can also help financially support Mormonish Podcast. We have links to Venmo and PayPal and mormonishpodcast.org if you'd like to help us we really appreciate those of you that do it just means so much to you or to us and to you hopefully and there's also a new link in our show notes and that is to what landon to the merch yeah <laughs> to our merch we have mormonish merch now isn't that fun i'm <laughs> loving this mug we have mugs and hats and and t-shirts and sweatshirts and water bottles and maybe everybody keeps asking about it a mormonish bikini Landon did design one, but I have yet to let him put it on the site. So yes, I, <laughs> we'll talk I about make it. a few more modifications. I feel like the way he designed it, the way the logos are placed, it's a little, yeah, I don't think a girl would wear that. You need to let me help you with that, Landon. So anyway, merch, it's all ladies. Kind of summer is coming. Uh, you you want to get in that bikini and Nothing like a Mormonish bikini. To... <laughs> well, then I'm going to design a Mormonish speedo for the men. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna put this all together. It's good, and we're gonna buy one and give it to Rob so that he can wear it next time. He's on the phone. <laughs> Anyone who's a guest on the show gets yep. a speedo. <laughs> I wouldn't put on a speedo if I was alone in a room by myself. <laughs> God. Oh my gosh. All right. And thank you so much again, Rob. You are just one of our favorite people to talk to. You're just so knowledgeable and on so many different topics. Like it seems like anything we just bring up kind of, oh, and he's like, oh, this, I know everything. So no, you know, no, we're going to link like Rob's said. other episodes in the show notes because he's just a, just a wonderful, just a joy to have on the show every time. So we appreciate all of you and thank you so much. We will see you next time on Mormonish Podcast. Bye everybody. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Mormonish. We really appreciate our listeners and would love to hear from you if you have a story you'd like to share. You can email us at mormonishpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on our website, mormonishpodcast.org. And don't forget to look for us on YouTube and like and subscribe. Keep joyful, everybody.